Hello, thank you so much for joining us at the Pursuit Podcast. My name is Jessica Rose, and today I'm going to be talking with Stuart Language. Hello, Jess. Stuart. Stuart, today we're going to be talking about sort of getting into public speaking, and we're going to be talking about researching and writing your talk. What kind of background do you have? Well, um, I spent a long time as a developer and manager of developers and so on, and I now work for myself. So I go and give people advice, so on and so forth. But I've done a lot of conference speaking, both in the past and recently and so on. So I bring a certain amount of knowledge. <laughs> what, do you remember your first conference talk? Ooh. Um, <laughs> distinction between, I think, there are two different kinds of talks. You've got kind of small local meetups, which are great. So you're going, and there's 15 or 20 or 30 people, and it's very friendly, very nice. There's much more of a sort of dialogue with the audience. And then you've got big picture, I'm on stage, 200 pounds a ticket, conference talks. My first big conference thing, well, one of the first ones was at Media, which was run in London. And I was on a panel, actually, with Brendan Eich, a couple of other people. It's a very casual name drop. <laughs> I know, it's just absolutely shameless. I do apologise. That wasn't intentionally a name drop so much as I can't remember who else was on the <laughs> panel. <laughs> I was worried you were going to ask me that. Yeah, so that that's a very different thing. I did quite a lot of kind of local small ones before that. That's a fantastic way to get started. So it's much more controlled, a lot more, not that you can screw up, but... The, the, word, the word forgiving did flow into my forgiving. mind. Forgiving. Um, it sounds slightly unfair to say this, but if you're looking to do a large conference, large conferences, you're looking to speak in that kind of environment, looking to fly places, so on and so forth, then practicing with a local group. No, I, I strongly recommend this. You shouldn't think of it like that. It's not just a trial run for the actual proper work. That's not how it is. They're both valuable in different ways. But it does give you a chance to refine your story, the method of delivery, how the bits that you've done and that didn't work, the bits that you've done that did work. And you can sit in the bar afterwards and get feedback, which is... Or I sit wherever yeah. uh, office and get feedback, which is a lot more difficult at a larger scale conference because you're a speaker and they're the audience. There are somehow there's, there's something of a barrier there. Sometimes. So that's something I think is really interesting, and I love to tell new and aspiring speakers this: is no one's ever going to come up to you and tell you the talk you just gave was rubbish. Yeah. There's this social contract where people have to be like, "Good job." It makes it difficult to get good feedback, but it does. It makes it easier to sleep at night. And, and there's, so you end up with something of a mismatch where, where you, you, you get the feedback out of the thing and you'll, you'll talk to people afterwards and they'll say, yeah, I thought it was great. And then a month or so afterwards, some conferences will get, will solicit oh. feedback from attendees. And then you read, and sometimes, you know, you, there'll be anonymous feedback and they'll pass it on or it's published or whatever. And you read it and you think, wow, loads of people will hate it. I'm the most useless speaker who's ever lived. And that's not the case. <laughs> It's um, just that people are mean in text boxes. M- more so, I think, yeah. So uh, some people who didn't enjoy it, as you yeah. say, there is a kind of a social restriction on the idea that you, you wouldn't want to go up to someone and say, your talk, it was rubbish. <laughs> but if you did think it was rubbish, you ought to feed that back somehow, so in the text box. <laughs> but that talk was rubbish. Rarely incredibly effective. Not, it's, not, <laughs> it's not useful feedback. And, and hopefully you won't get it too much. But yes, that kind of working on a, in a local environment, working for a small local meetup, giving a talk, getting feedback at that kind of thing, refining the message that you're putting across is really useful. So frankly, there are a lot more of them. I think as well, like meetup organizers are fairly understanding of the idea that this is a place that when established speakers come by, they're probably testing new stuff out. Yes. It's like Mondays at the comedy club. Yeah, but part of the advantage with that is you shouldn't, if, if you're a meetup organizer, I would implore you not to see it as it's being used as a trial run. It's more you're getting a sneak peek of this stuff. It's like the Beatles showing up and playing their new album before they release it, right? Well, is the theory. You giving a sneak peek is like the oh. Beatles showing up. <laughs> I don't think so. But, but, but I think that, I think that's kind of the idea that because you've got those two different environments, it gives you the chance to do talks in a number of different ways. Uh, so to folks listening out there right now, walk me through, how do you start writing a talk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, um, well, my, my research, I, I tend to let things just distill into my head. Most of the time, if someone says, I'm interested in uh, giving this talk at this conference, or I think to myself, I should, I should be speaking about this. It's not an idea that I learned about five minutes ago. It's been distilling in my head for ages and ages. So you just let it stew grumpily. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I rarely think up an idea and then go and research that idea. It's more things that I was partially interested in anyway. So I'll think, ah, oh, that seems to be a thing that I've been thinking about a lot. I'm interested in that. Now I'll go on to the research stage of finding out enough about it that I'm properly knowledgeable rather than just interested. But 
it's rare. If, if someone came to me and said, can you do a talk about this thing that you don't know anything about? I'd say, well, I could go and research and, and deliver it and so on. But then you're only inviting me for my delivery skills rather than my knowledge. And I don't really like giving talks like that. There is quite a lot of performance involved in giving a talk, but it shouldn't just be performance. The point is knowledgeability. So it really sounds like what you're saying is that when you when you set out to research and write a talk, it's really about something that's meaningful for you, something you've been wanting to say anyway. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I, I honestly couldn't agree more with that. It's I tend to think up a subject because it's, as I say, something that I'm already interested in or something where I think, now, I know about this, but people... People don't seem to think as I do. And sometimes you get into the research and you think, okay, there is a reason everyone doesn't think as I do, and that's because I'm wrong. (laughs) But then I've learned something. Otherwise, I think, okay, what I need to do is find a way of putting this message across in a way that people get what I'm talking about. So it's almost like seeing somebody being wrong on the internet and and doing a bunch of research to react to that. (laughs) That is a genuinely unkind way of describing my prose. (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) No, (laughs) I'm I'm joking, honestly. Um, It's... It, the problem is, it kind of is like that, but I, should, but I shouldn't admit, I should admit to this. But what about the actual writing process? So I can talk through mine where I'll, I'll have an idea, and if I'm being totally honest, I'll do a little bit of research to be like, uh, that, that validates my idea. And then I'll go ahead and write the abstracts and, and set them loose. And then when somebody comes back with an acceptance, I'm like, oh, I should write this talk. Um, my writing process is idiosyncratic. Okay. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't necessarily hold this up as an exemplar for someone to, to copy. It's, it's what works for me. So because by the time I'm in a position to want to do a talk, I've already done the research. I wouldn't start offering it around. Oh. Yeah. I, um, I, I don't offer talks on spec and then am prompted by that to do it because the stuff that I'm doing is stuff that I'm, because I'm interested in it anyway. Yeah. It's stuff that's useful to me, either um, when I'm consulting for people or when I'm building things myself or just for my own personal knowledge. It's stuff that I'm going to find useful even if I never deliver the talk to anybody. It's rare that I'll offer a talk and no one ever picks it up. But even if that happened, that would be fine because I've still spent um, time learning about something that that I'm interested in, that I wanted to do regardless. So this sort of dovetails quite neatly with the idea that I don't think up an idea and then test whether it's viable by offering it as a talk. How, how do you do the actual writing, though? So I, I've got two processes, one where I'll get a big piece of paper and start drawing squares and cross them out and make them point to different things. So I paper prototyping a talk with here, talk about squirrels or, you know, whatever. I've, I've not yet gotten a talk about squirrels in. <laughs> High hopes. How TDD is like squirrels. Um, so I'll go ahead and either literally paper prototype it out, like here, talk about this thing, tell this story. Or one thing I've started doing that works really well for me is get up a blank slide deck and just say, like, this slide, talk about this thing. Here, add a picture of a banana. Uh, I'm, I work almost in reverse of that. Cool. First thing, number one Stuart rule, <laughs> if your slides are useful without the talk, you have too much information on your slides. I think a lot of things about this. So I did a bunch of talks with very minimalist image slides. And actually, I'm going to be doing a a sort of more advanced talk about public speaking in uh, mixed linguistics environments, so places where your language is not necessarily the first language of the speakers. And I got a lot of feedback when I had these image-heavy slides in um, speaking in other countries where they said, you know what, this would have been really helpful if you had text echoing what you're saying. Okay, yeah, 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 there, yeah. there are people who think this. I am of the opinion that if the slides are valuable without talk, then there wasn't a lot of point in you having the talk. What you should have done is written an essay and had it published. The, the whole point of delivering a talk rather than delivering a blog post is precisely that you can do things in a talk that you can't do with just the written word. So when people will quite often say, can we have a copy of your slides? And I'll say, yep. okay, you're welcome to them, but they're not going to be very useful to you because every single one of them has got two words on it. The slides are a backup. They're there. If you have too much information on your slides, if your slides are useful, then people aren't listening to you, they're reading the slides. I absolutely agree with this. I've started making a shareable deck and my real deck. Ah, now that's an interesting step. Yeah. Um, so, so you've got the deck you actually present with, and then you've got an an artifact, a a thing which you can give people in lieu of the talk. Uh, yeah, I do an imposter syndrome talk that has very very simplistic. Here's a picture of an apple. Here's a, uh, and people would ask for the slides and then come back and be like, "What is this garbage?" 
<laughs> now, wh- one of the things is that watching a talk is, it's nowhere near as information dense as the written word, which means that something that you might learn from reading in five minutes will, is a half hour talk, for example. And a push 15 minutes. You look at TED Talks, they're 14 minutes, and you can change the whole world with the TED Talk. So. I've been told. The idea that you don't need, you don't need an hour long talk is a reasonable <laughs> one. But, a lot of people, they can't spend the time necessarily to watch or listen to a one hour long talk, especially since for a lot of talks, if you're watching them, you can't be doing anything else while you're doing that. So the idea of having a separate thing, a created artifact that you can give people to say, you couldn't watch a talk, but you can learn this instead. So, so you have a talk and a, a think piece, which go hand in hand, or a talk and a guide, or something like that. It's similar to strategy guides for video games, that kind of vibe. Like a podcast and a blog post. Like a podcast <laughs> and a blog post, exactly that. But the way I do, this is the idiosyncratic thing. I, I sit and I write my talk. With like, pen and paper. Um, these days I normally type okay. it. I used to actually write it longhand. Do you keep any of them? <sighs> Somewhere. Um, How be, cool. There'll, there'll be boxes in, I was going to say in my loft, but I haven't got a loft now because I've got a flat my parents' loft, I think, which which will have longhand written talks in them. Oh, how fantastic. Uh, like, well, yeah, but I'm not George Orwell. No one's going to collect these things and publish them afterwards. They're just scrawled bits of paper. Oh, hush, hush, don't talk yourself down. <laughs> not that much. But like those those artifacts, even for yourself to go back and look at like, ah, oh, this was my thinking process back then. Yes. Here's the way I'm doing things now. But the reason I don't keep most of them is that I write my talk out completely longhand. It like for, for the short beginning. notes or like no 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 the whole thing good word, morning, word for word you could stand here and read this out and it would be my talk. This is super different from my style. Oh, right, exactly, and then uh, but, but it goes on. Once I have that written out, while I'm doing that, I'll have a picture in my head of what some of the slides are, and I'll put notes in into the written out thing, saying you know slide of thing here. But as I say, because my slides tend to be, I want a picture sort of like this, um, or I just want these two words which enhance the thing. So I write that out. I then design the slide deck from the written thing. I then add notes to the slide deck which prompt me about, you were going to say this, you were going to say this, and then I throw the longhand version away. Okay. Um, and then, so on the day, I'm presenting from the notes, but I remember what I wanted the talk to say. But I'm not reading. I'm not reading a memorized talk. Yeah. So it's spontaneous. You're reinterpreting yes. the talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I make the notes from the written out longhand version, and then I talk from the notes. I, yeah. I don't talk from the slides. We should never do a joint talk. <laughs> I, I said it was idiosyncratic. I've never run into anyone else who does this. Uh, so mine is I'll I'll go ahead and either with paper or with a blank slide deck, make notes about what I want there. And then slowly fill in the slides. I'll never write out my whole talk. If it's a new topic and I really think I need notes, I'll often hide a index card that spins squ- squared off into four squares with one or two word notes. Oh, okay. And one thing I absolutely love to do, and this is more of a talk tips and tricks sort of thing, is uh, on on stage, oftentimes you've got a podium over here with the with your computer. Yeah. Um, I love, usually you can pull up the, the cables and put it on the floor in front of you on stage. And just having your your next slide in front of you where you, it looks like you're looking at the audience, but you can also see what's happening next is uh, okay. fantastic for flow. Uh, certainly. I mean, I, um, normally if I'm, um, when I'm presenting, you've got the presenter console or whatever, so I can see yeah. what the next slide is and the notes. One of the challenges I have is that... Ideally, the notes would just be AIDS memoir, like yeah. two or three words, and that's it. In practice, I tend to, because my slides don't carry any detail, and I don't like presenting from the slides, you should be able yeah. to present without seeing your slides and be fine. Oh, okay. Um, we, we, we might be able to politely argue. <laughs> um, part of the reason for that is, as I said, I think the slides are back up to your talk alone. And there are so many people who present from their slides, who put up a slide and then work through it. And I think, if anything else, the slides change without you looking at them. If you did a half an hour talk, how many slides would you have? Finger in the air, I guess. I'm not going to hold you to it. Oh, no, I've got a system. I'd have between 45 and 50. Okay, I'd probably have 100. Oh. Um, <laughs> but each of my talks are kind of flick, 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 uh, move on to the next thing. They, they are points to back up what I'm saying. And because of that, because a given point might encompass seven or eight or nine slides, I've got to have a reasonably worked out 
thing, not only of what I'm going to say, but how I'm going to say it. Oh. Because the slides have to be in order. If you're making a point and there are seven separate aspects to it, and you've got seven slides which you're going to flick through in the background without ever looking at the screen... You've got to make the points in the right order, otherwise Just they don't match with the slides. Describe that makes me real nervous. It's um, idiosyncratic, as I say, and you've got to practice the talk a reasonable amount. Oh yeah, otherwise you'll gnaws it up. Um, on the <laughs> on, on the other hand, you can occasionally glance at your slide and remind yourself, but that's why I need the notes because the notes for a given slide don't only tell me what this slide is about because the word on the slide should remind me of that, but what the next slide is going to be. Oh, I thought you meant without seeing your slides at all. Um, you should be able to do it without seeing your slides, in theory, but I need the notes. Yeah. But mostly I need the notes because of transitions. So that's the big thing for me, is is knowing... Or you, you've accidentally clicked the button twice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have something of a weakness for the technique where you make a point and then press the button and something comes up which illustrates your point and then everyone laughs and then you go on. Oh, you're going to love... A talk at a meetup tonight. <laughs> I do that a lot. I, I spend some time with. Do you know Damien Conway? Uh, no, the um, um, used to be a pearl guy. He's now uh, well, he's still a pearl guy. The pearl, like the pearl conference I've been to, where I have absolutely stunning speakers. Well, Damien is a professional speaker coach, so I spend some time with him, and he, he'd be a, um, for your tips and tricks suggestion. He's got a whole bag full of them, and. Most of the stuff, because I've done a reasonable amount of public speaking beforehand, the, the, the general principles aren't stupid, but lots of little things. You think, oh, that's such a good little enhancement to the process. Stupid things, like I put together slides, and then you critique the slides. This, this will come up in your, in your slide conversation. But things like just adding a little bit of shadow to the words so they show up better on a picture. And one of his critiques of my style is that I've got too many visual jokes in the slides. And oh. I said, okay... I understand your critique. I'm just not changing it. <laughs> and I think that's something really interesting. It, it doesn't touch on so much um, sort of writing and research so yes. much as the, the very way you deliver it. And I think for speakers, it takes you a while to get there, but realizing that everyone has their own style and that's fine. Yes. And, and that's what I think the the writing process is about. The research process, you, you research in your own way. You decide the points you want to make, make sure you can back them up, so on and so forth. The writing process, to me, you need to think about how you're going to deliver the talk. I think very much in terms of here are the moments where I'll say this and I want that thing to sink into people's heads. So how you do the delivery. But all of the hard work there is done in the writing. It's delivery in theory. If I knew a way of dictating my thought process in a way that other people could understand it, in theory, you could take my notes and someone else could deliver a talk in my style. In practice, I don't know how to write it down. Lots of emoji? (laughs) <laughs> zero emoji in my writing style i know granddad right i'm terrible <laughs> um but i think that's the point thinking about how you're going to deliver the talk dictates to me at least how i write it this is why i write it out longhand why because then i know not only the points i'm going to make but how i'm going to phrase them and i can sit and think about it and say no i don't want to make that point i, I need a beat here i need an offbeat here I need a slide fits in at this point. I need to I need to make this point and this so, so I need repetition of this point over things. I've got a cadence to the speech. And that becomes part of the written text. That's fantastic. I think one of the things that's really great here is we've we both have very, very different research and writing styles. We do. <laughs> <laughs> So you're very, I'm going to write all this, I'm going to get an idea, I'm going to stick with this one idea, this is my idea, I'm going to write it out free, I'm going to do the research and write it out freehand, uh, or longhand, tap, 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 Um, whereas I'm very much like, I'm interested in these three or four things, I'm going to go ahead and write out the abstracts and see what people want to hear about, and then, well, do the research and write the abstracts, and then do some more research and write the talks, and in a very pen and paper, oh, let's have a joke here, let's have the narrative portion here. Ah, uh, right. So so you're a uh, much more a boxes and arrows. Um, yeah, I am, I'll go ahead and add some notes on my process for this, but it is very much like these five slides, these, these three, four minutes, let's tell the introductory story of why we're learning about this. Okay. Or, you know, at the body of this, the 10 minutes is why this is such a big deal in technology, why this is something you should pay attention to. Right. Then the solution phase, what you can do to, to do better at X, Y, Z. I, I do that implicitly, I suppose. Obviously, you need that. You need that structure to the talk. I just don't do it explicitly. And I suspect 
that for someone coming new to speaking, your technique, at least for that part of it, is probably more useful. You need having some sense of this is the structure and maybe having some sense of this is what a structure should look like. You need, but this is back to when you're being taught to write essays at school. You you have to have a beginning, a middle and end. You have to have a results and a conclusion. You need to, to introduce a point and then make the point and then conclude the point. And I think most talks I really enjoy have a hello, here's who I am. Here's what we're talking about. And I really, really like ones that have a short narrative. Here's why I'm telling you this. Here's why this matters. Here's a human relatable reason you should invest in this talk. They're, part of the advantage with that, back to my thing about slides, <laughs> is that the worst thing you can do is have a slides with bullet points on them. Never, Absolutely. ever, ever do this. First of all, because it encourages you to just read through your slides and so on. But secondly, it encourages you to think in a bullet point way. There is very little in the world which is actually solved by saying, here are these five independent addressable points and let's work through them one by one. It doesn't work like that, right? Code works like that. The world doesn't. I'm going to give you a tiny caveat. Okay. I do enjoy using bullet points for when I'm saying, and these are important for reasons, and just putting a bullet point list up there. That way I just have to say, there are reasons this is important. Boom. Y'all have seen him. This is a, a, a shareable artifact thing again. It, yeah. it, it, it's something where later on someone says, but why is that important? You can go check it out. Da-da, slide. I um, think it's <laughs> so I don't get well actually as often in... Con- at, oh, yeah. that's Because I was like, it's really important that we adhere to these best practices. Why? I'd be like, slide 14, dude. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, as you say, it's to avoid well actually um, a whataboutery. Yes. <laughs> You'd be like, have you considered? I'd be like... Yes, I have, because it was point four on the slide, which I skipped through, but it was there, and you need to pay attention to it. Um, so, yeah, that kind of avoiding what aboutery is, I think, important. Um, well, we'll, we'll address this uh, again more in the tips and tricks, but I think recognizing that uh, in a lot of conference talks or in a lot of public speaking, there's going to be somebody in the audience who really wants to get their voice heard. So a lot of time their objections or their challenges is really saying, also look at me. Yes. Um, so stealing your heart and going forth patiently. Like, absolutely listen to real challenges, absolutely learn from people in the audience. Uh, but if somebody's just kind of trying to show off and be a jerk, uh, smile as politely or growl as menacingly as your heart leads you to. Yes, this is, it's something where I'm kind of unsure whether conference organisers and so on could take a slightly stronger stance on this than they currently do. Some conferences do a brilliant job of setting the culture so that no one even picks up a microphone and launches on a three-minute rant disguised as a question, either because people who would do that don't come to the conference in the first place or because they do come there, but it becomes very apparent that that sort of thing's not acceptable. But if it does happen, it's kind of on the speaker to do something about it. And it's enormously supernaturally difficult to interrupt a questioner from the stage without looking like Marie Antoinette, right? I'm a really important public speaker and you're just a peon. Shut up, right? And that's a terrible way to present yourself. Even if most of the audience would understand and sympathise with the reasons, you can't do it without looking like Oh, it's like still a look brute. rubbish on the video. <laughs> yeah, totally. So... I wonder whether there should be some way of doing that. I don't know what the way is. I really don't know how so to fix it. So I've given my voice and accent and the general happy bunny way that I navigate the world. Uh, I do get quite a few, oh, but what about this is? Uh, uh, so two things I've started doing is if I have a talk that has a regular, but what about this point that people are likely to bring up, I'll mention it as part of the talk where I'm like, <laughs> I've had some people bring this up, but that's completely ridiculous because... Um, preemptive don't ask this question because I've already said if you ask this question you'll look a bit foolish well, with, with, the, with the suggestion that ugh other audiences not, not y'all y'all <laughs> yes but, but, but that's that, that's a perfectly legit and legit. then when folks are going on a little bit too long about their point um, just a very polite very earnest like oh oh I see are you trying to ask about one two three very very short question yeah um and generally, especially with, I'm, I'm sorry, generally with British audiences, um, that's, that's enough to be like, oh, you want me to show? Yeah, that was my question. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you can anticipate someone's question, that's a, that's a really good. Like once they get a couple keywords out, if, if it's apparent, they're going to keep going. Just be like, oh, are you asking me about the applications in a wider industry outside of technology? And part of that is as you deliver a talk in more venues and to more audiences, you'll get much more of a sense of the kinds of things people would ask. And as you say, you can either go back and make sure that it's already addressed in the slides, or you'll be used to the idea that this question will come up and therefore anticipate it. 
stupid story. For a long time, I thought it was somehow immoral to deliver a talk more than once. That's kind of... I respect you, and this is a fantastic point to address to to listeners. You, the fabulous listener, if you're ready to get on stage, if you're ready to give a talk, absolutely reuse your talks. This is exactly why I'm mentioning it, because I spent three, four years... This is 10, 15 years ago now, but I spent a long time thinking, but... I, I would be somehow cheating an audience if I showed up and delivered a talk I'd done already. I now, obviously, it's moronic. But your talk gets better and better. Yes, oh, totally. I, I don't think it now, but I didn't know. And it occurred to me that I wanted to mention it. No, that's such a fantastic point. Exactly, because I can imagine a bunch of people thinking, oh, am I allowed to do a talk more than once? Yeah. And being completely mercenary about it a bit, it amortises the cost of creating it. If you're going to spend uh, evenings and weekends around your job or spend time away from paid work to prep a talk and so on, if you can deliver it five times, then you're a lot better off because you're defraying the the time and effort you put into it. In addition to the fact that it gets better every time you get more experience of delivering it. That joke didn't work. This slide looks weird. Yeah. I, I can't, can't tell you how many times I've... I've <laughs> okay, that joke fell flat. I, I, I'll cut that one. Put something else in it. And it's really interesting that like audience to audience you'll get very very different receptions yes absolutely a thing you said there about a british audience you're able to shame is not quite the right word but gently discourage yes lean on someone and and then we'll say oh and get the message and that's not necessarily the case elsewhere but you get very different kinds of questions you need to do very different styles of writing sometimes not necessarily the research but making sure your customer like if you're going to be giving this talk You've written a talk. It's fantastic. You love it. You've researched it. You've got it accepted. And you're going to take it on the road. Yes. And this is fantastic. Uh, Listener, if you've never given a conference talk before, they should give you a free ticket. But if it involves travel, they should also cover your travel and hotel. Uh, To to be clear, I I would be stronger than that. If a conference says you have to pay for a ticket that you're talking at, do not go to that conference. Ironclad rule, in my opinion. Um, I can understand how some places will say to you, do you know what? We can't afford to pay speaker expenses and so on. And if they're something small and they're charging people a five for a ticket or they're doing it for cost or something, then fine. If someone's charging people yeah. £250 a ticket and they say we can't afford speaker expenses, then they're just being tight, don't go. If but it's something like a word camp or something like really yeah. small community run, I'll go ahead and pay my ticket when I can. Yeah, because I think, well, I'll go to the conference and I'll enjoy meeting yeah. people and so on. And I'm doing something for the community. That's, that, that's good. And I enjoy that kind of thing. But you should never have to pay for a ticket for a conference you're speaking at. They should, comping you a ticket doesn't cost them any money. Um, so the least they could do. I, I wouldn't sit still for that. Yeah, you shouldn't be paying money to do work for other people. <laughs> no. Like, public speaking is absolutely work. You as a speaker... You and fantastic attendees are the people who make the conference happen. Absolutely. You're worth it, right? You you have been... There's... Imposter syndrome is something that Jess knows quite a lot about here. Oh, God, God, that sounds terrible. Goodness. Oh, no, no. (laughs) I'm fine with that. (laughs) Uh, he's quite an expert in uh, methods of addressing and so on and so forth. Perhaps. There's nothing you can really do. Like, your brain is terrible. I, Everything's terrible. I know the feeling. But, <laughs> but yes, the, there is something to be said for thinking about the idea that you have been accepted to to speak at this conference. They, they looked at a list of everybody and they picked you. There is worth there. And you are worth, therefore, the, the price of them. Even if that's just attendance at the conference for nothing. And sometimes conference organizers will make you ask. Um, where you say, hi, um, what's the policy on travel and hotel? Ask. I don't care if this is your very first talk. I don't care if you don't feel like you're ready. I don't care if you think your talk is going to be rubbish. It's going to be fine, I promise. Yes. I pro- Make this your ringtone if you need to. Uh, your talk is going to be fantastic. Spend the time on it. It's going to be great. But you're making this happen. You should get your expenses covered. And think back on all of the talks you've seen, all the talks online, all the conference talks. You've seen some mediocre talks, right? <laughs> no, I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, yes, I have seen But mediocre. those folks still got their expenses covered. Yes. You're going to do a lot better than a lot of people. Make sure you're not paying to get on the road. Yes, absolutely. It should not cost you money or time that you that you don't think is a worthwhile investment. Whether that's because you want to do it because you like it or because you want to get more experience in public speaking or because you want to raise your profile a bit or because you want to get paid, that's fine. But be sure that the time you're putting in is is justified in your own eyes. However you justify that time is up to you. But if you feel like you're being taken for a ride, ask someone, what can we do to fix this? Oh, and yeah, if anybody is dealing with a conference organiser where you're not quite sure if everything's on the level... Pop me an email. I'm at hello at jessica.tech and I'll fuss you out and tell you to get paid. <laughs>
Yes. Um, so one of the things, one of the other things that I wanted to mention to think about is that you should practice your talk. Don't just write it out and make the slides and so on. You need to actually practice uh, the, the whole thing. Don't just sit there and read through it in your head and flick through the slides. You have to actually stand up with the clicker in your hand and actually go through your talk. Present it to the wall or your family or... Uh, I would actually count this as part of research. Like, until you said this out loud a couple of times, you're like, that... That doesn't make any sense. Why would I Why would I do that? Yes. But part of the reason you do that is for timing. Now, if as you get more and more into this, you can pretty much know how long a talk is going to take. You'll say, okay, it's going to take about this long. And you can adjust it on the fly. Right? It's not like you're delivering a video and it's going to be that long however it is. If you're, if you're going slightly fast or slightly slow, then you can speed up or slow down or skip a point or... or over address a point and that's fine but having some sense of how long the thing will be it's always different on stage to how it is when you're in your own office but again a large part of that is down to your style um i used to think that the difference was always that it was quicker on stage and then it turned out that some people take longer on stage and i think okay so there's something you need to learn about yourself and realistically there's no way of doing that other than doing half a dozen talks and then comparing the amount of time you took to do them with the amount of time you took when you practiced them. But practicing the talk is just as part of, it's part of research, part of the writing process, because it not only gives you a sense of how long it's all going to take, but you can find things that you stumble over saying and think, I need to reword that or think of a different way of saying it. You feel prepared. You ought to be aiming for nobody can do this right unless they've had stone cold professional speaker training nobody does but you ought to be able to deliver a talk without saying the word uh once in my opinion that's uh. that, that to, to, to be to be clear that's a goal to shoot for and you're, you're not you're not expected to achieve it i certainly can't do it uh lister if it makes you feel better i've been speaking at hundreds of conferences and i am quite um er, uh, heavy. yeah i mean i can't do it either but if you try and aim for that it means that you'll make sure that your speech is well prepared that you know roughly what you're going to say and you know which order you're going to say it in you know the phrases you're going to use the wording the vocab that you're going to present this with and again that will change as you deliver a talk more and more you'll get much more of a sense of this resonated with the audience this seemed to pass them by a bit i had to explain this twice or three times so on and so forth but aiming for consistent speech some people think it sounds slick and you sound inauthentic but i don't agree with that if you if you watch um professional speakers if you watch the people at the ted talks for example not all of them are professional speakers but they are made to practice like something insane tim urban the chap who does wait but why he he was asked to do a ted talk and he wrote up the process by which you prepare for it Ooh. and they, it's fascinating reading because you have to practice it hundreds of times you have to go and practice it in front of them you have to practice it yourself you have to be able to deliver it this but and it takes this much time and they and they make you narrow it down and practice it again and then exhibit it to them and so on and so forth and it's right at the very top end of how much you need to practice a talk but part of it is that they can then be sure that you will deliver a brilliant thing in 14 minutes and that's why ted talks are all really good it's not because these people are all necessarily geniuses. It's because they've delivered a talk which they've practiced 400 times for six months in advance of the talk. Now, most of us can't afford to dedicate that much time and effort to something. If you get invited to TED, then, you know, say the word and bung me a ticket. Yeah. But well, TEDx uh, events are yeah. good for this. Um, but that level of practice is high. But it does give you the sense that you can present the talk in a way that you are totally comfortable with that's more what it is i think it's about being comfortable on stage so one of my favorite things to do to practice the talk and this is fantastic because you can do it in the hotel room as well almost all modern tvs will let you plug your laptop into them yes so do that prop it up stand with your back to the screen as though you're really on stage and make sure you can see your notes and just run through it a couple times you're standing up you've got a screen behind you it feels a lot like being on stage will feel sneaky trick for that um it, and it depends quite a lot on how your hotel room is laid out but quite often it works that you can that your television is opposite a mirror or can be tilted to be opposite a mirror at which point you can stand in front of the tv so the screen is behind you just like you would be on stage exactly as you say but then you can also see yourself that is probably a fantastic tip, but something I never want to do. <laughs> you, you, just, just, just saying that out loud, I was like, no, I hate that. You do have to be slightly comfortable with the idea of looking at yourself. Filming yourself 
I hate that more than anything, but it's really valuable. It is. It will teach you things like you'll watch it and think, goodness me, I wave my hands around a lot when I'm talking. <laughs> like, oh, I'm making that face again. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, that's the sort of thing where you can't really get feedback for it because people won't remember. If you ask someone after a talk, they will, they remember the overall, the overall vibe, the overall mise-en-scene of the talk, and the and they'll remember individual points. But most things, something will come up and they'll think, oh, didn't really agree with that, and then move on and they won't remember it afterwards. So this is where videos and so on are useful, but you can video your own practices as well for the same reasons. So this is something that I think is fantastic and absolutely something that took me ages to learn, is that when you, so the little tiny mistakes you make in your talk the only person who really notices them are you. Yes. So if you stumble over a word, it feels really unnatural, but just keep going. If you go back and try and restate it and restate it, you've got a great chance to stumble and stumble. Yes. Where if you just sort of mumble something or stumble or say the wrong word, keep going. The way humans process language, it means as long as you keep going confidently, people will just fill in the rest with their brains. Yeah, it's like singing on stage. If you go and do a, a sung performance and you get some of the words wrong, you just keep going. What you can't do is stop because then the whole band has to stop and it all goes wrong. Imagine there's a band. And oh, God, no, that's worse, not better. <laughs> um, again, some of, a, a lot of these things are idiosyncratic. Again, they are ways of thinking that, that will work for Did you. Did you make a bunch of notes else. to be like, I'm going to recommend the most terrifying advice possible? <laughs> Imagine there's a band behind you. The point about the band thing is there's a sense of momentum. Which is well, fantastic. Yes, and, and you don't want to break that. If you're delivering the talk, once people are caught up in the message, they're interested in what you're saying, if you break the momentum, then you've got to build that back up again. And making a mistake or stumbling over a point does not break momentum. Stopping does. And again, this is... Not all talks are like this. You don't have to be giving a... Uh, Josiah Bartlett, hand on heart, uh, inspire everyone to leave and immediately rewrite their lives talk, right? You're allowed to go somewhere and talk about sequel. It's fine. I've seen lots of inspiring talks about sequel. That got very high pitched. (laughs) I've seen lots of inspiring talks about sequel. Good work. (laughs) I'm not sure I've seen lots. (laughs) But but, but, but you see my point. you, You don't have to be doing inspirational stuff to have momentum and speaker techniques um, I mentioned earlier things like floating opposites this stuff is useful and there's loads of literature about it and you can just sit and read it and you don't have to slavishly follow all of this stuff but just having more techniques in your, in, in your tool bag there's, um, there used to be a set of techniques called rhetoric and they were different approaches you could use to language and this stuff that was studied up until Victorian uh, era or so and then it kind of dropped away so the idea of hendiadis and things like this it, it you look at it and you think well what's this madly named greek stuff and some of it so well. things like alliteration using the same letter and over and over again or assonance using the same vowel sounds and so on and they're all techniques for speaking techniques for writing and they're just little things but they can give your writing and your speaking more punch and just being aware of this stuff is eye-opening. You don't have to use it, and it's not a rule book. But that kind of thing flows into the writing, and it's something you can use when you're actually writing as well, not just writing a talk, but doing writing in general, if you're writing essays or blog posts or so on, or just even emails to people. It tends to make you sound slightly highfalutin in emails, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're if you're writing to your friends, then getting some sense of how of how that works is is thing. I mean, I write poetry for exactly that reason, the command of language thing, and it helps, I think, with flow and with how you produce a sentence. But you don't have to go anywhere near that far into it. Just. Be comfortable with with your own speech patterns, with the way you talk, with the way you present an idea. And that comes across on stage. On this fantastic note, the idea of bringing poetry and rhetoric into your speaking, into your writing and into your research, I think we're going to close things off. Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you again for listening. 